Hi, listeners. We want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aueli, Jose Andres, Jettila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one collar's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inews, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com slash radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Whether you're a chef or just love going to restaurants, you know the best ingredients are everything. Westholm is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. Learn more at westholm.com. Culture and Flavor is a podcast about food and culture centered in Black and Indigenous food ways. Hosted by myself, Zella Palmer, right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Each episode features high vibrational conversations with cultural bearers, chefs, farmers, scholars, barbecue pit masters, and more. Where there is flavor, there is history. Join me on Culture and Flavor and all of my guests as we share stories that will have you praise dancing, cooking, conjuring, and inspiring your culinary journey. Hey, y'all. I am over the top excited. I am uh, sitting here in the seventh ward of New Orleans in Madame Barbara Trevine's home, the amazing Madame Barbara Trevine. If you listen to last season's episode, we talked a lot about Marie Laveau, Creole culture in, in New Orleans, and all of her stories about food and um, voodoo and all of these amazing, uh, you know, moments in in New Orleans history that really created this amazing culture. So I want us to really welcome my dear, dear, dear friend and mentor, Madame Barbara Trevine to Culture and Flavor. Welcome, Madame Barbara Trevine. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Elda. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So last time we met, last time we were, had, were on Culture and Flavor, we said we were going to do a follow-up about food and voodoo. Remember that? Yes, yes. Yeah. But you know, we have to say something about Marie. Absolutely. Let's go Let's yeah, go to Marie. Because when you talk about voodoo, mm-hmm. the first name that come up is Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen mm-hmm. of New Orleans. Yes, yes. And you've done extensive research on Marie Laveau. And you brought out this box before we got started, just, you know, of all these amazing, you know, culture, material culture from, you know, salves and duck fat and, you know, alum. And we're, we're going to talk about what that is and what that was used for. But I would love for you to just talk a little bit about the voodoo queen, Marie Laveau. Oh, Marie was very, very interesting. However, the, the newspaper propelled her. And that's how Marie became famous in a way. And she was called the voodoo queen of New Orleans. But Marie had several different identities, professions, since she was born for all the decades that that she lived. You know, she she was a healer, and she probably learned these the art of this from her maternal grandmother, because her mother wasn't that born to her life, but her grandmother and that link was from directly from Africa. And they were here the like the I'm assuming the first slave ship that arrived here, you know, after we it was settled by the by the French. So she did a lot. 
she not only was a healer, like the Tretors mm-hmm. in the uh, in the other areas, they believed in healing with prayer and with herbs, and so did Marie. Marie also had her home of borders. There was a lot of borders in in the 1800s that stayed with Marie, and she nursed them. And I think it was about 20 borders that that she had from all walks of life and all races. She also, I will call her the first Eucharistic minister because she would go to the condemned prisoners' cells. She would paint the cells white. She would erect an altar on a table in their cell. She would have flowers. She would have statues of religious icons. She would bring food to them because she cooked food and brought it to the condemned prisoners as well. And one time she brought a coffin to the jail because the man did not have a uh, coffin. And the man who was here alone asked for a dress from his little girl. And she was about about three or four. I don't recollect her exact age at this time. And Marie made it into a pillow. And she decorated his coffin with that. So he was, I guess I assume he was very, very happy because he was all alone. He didn't have any other relatives here in the city. She also... Oh, by the time she was doing that, she had already been doing it before the period in the paper, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So that, that takes two decades in her life into other things that, that she did. She would serve as surety to women of color who were arrested for talking back to any white woman, hurting them in any way, and not respecting them. So she served as surety. She didn't give it for them to be released. She just put it up as a bond for her, for them, I should say. She also was in the um, program where you sponsor someone to learn a trade. And she did that with a young man who was from Haiti. And all of this had to be okayed and signed by the Dennis Prier, who was our the legal person in charge of that. Marie probably learn all these herbs and the prayers because she had to be baptized Roman Catholic. So for listeners, remember, she was born Catholic. She was baptized in a Catholic religion. She practiced Catholicism. And she also, when she died, she was buried in a consecrated Catholic cemetery. Mm. So there wasn't a voodoo cemetery. It was the Roman Catholic cemetery. So Marie was very, very helpful. And my grandmother would always say, girl, you look like Marie Laveau. And I would say, why? (laughs) Why? You you got those big earrings in your ears. Well, because I like hoop earrings and I like large hoop earrings. Earrings. I said, well, who was this Marie Laveau? And I was real young. She said, oh, she was a powerful woman. I said, well, what was her powers? You know, I was young. She said, oh, well, they had a lot of people went to her for help. And I play her numbers in the lottery because my grandmother used to play lottery and leave it on the porch for Cherry. His name was Cherry. He was the lottery man. And, you know, this was illegal back then. I said, that's her numbers? Yeah, 3, 7, and 11. So if you have a paper or pencil, try that number, 3, 7, and 11. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to know who was Marie Laveau. And the people, you know, I I was growing up, getting there, and I would ask people about Marie Laveau. And they would tell me, oh, well, one one incident in particular, a lady told me, oh, uh, I have a Marie Laveau's hairbrush. I said, can I come see it? Mm -hmm. I went by her house. She said, well, you know, I can't find it right now. And it was my great-grandmother's hairbrush. She said that she got it from a cousin of hers 
who, who's been dead, but I, I don't know what happened to it, but that's, that's was the story in our family. And then another lady asked me very seriously, was Marie Laveau buried standing up in a tomb? And I said, well, I don't know of anybody <laughs> buried standing up, you know, in New Orleans. I said, but dying in New Orleans is more than just dying. Hmm. It's more than that. Somebody have to bring the smelling salt. Somebody have to bring a pot of coffee. Somebody have to take names. And it's it's a whole different realm of dying it's not a simple process to just die in New Orleans. And when Ernie Cato died, I saw his wife putting ribbons on his coffin, curls, and I'm like, ooh, somebody told you about that. I know the other people here are thinking you're a little bit craque, a little dense or had problems with your brain. I said, but you don't know what you're doing because that's just what they did with the coffins back then. Even the horses, white plumes were used for children if they elected, and black plumes were used for adults. So that was keeping with that tradition. But the people in there didn't know Antoinette was really doing that from where maybe what she heard or maybe it was folk you know, Lord tours, but that's what she, that's what she was doing. And I was so honored to see her doing that. I'm like, go girl, mm. go girl. That is, that was a beautiful thing to see her, to see her do. So Marie, Marie was married by the time she was 18. She had two children for Jacques Paris, who was from Haiti and they died young. None of her male children survived with Monsieur Glapiel, who was a French extraction. And she had children with him. She had two girls, and those two girls had children. So you would be, if you're from New Orleans, you would be related to her non-legal husband who cohabitated with her. And I'm using the word cohabitated with her because that was her grandmother's property. So she didn't go live with him. He came and lived with her. You would be related to his line. You would not be related to Marie Laveau. Mm -hmm. You would be related to Louis Christophe Dominique de Glapion, which was the man that she cohabitated with and had these female children and had male children too, but they did not survive. So therefore you you'd have to be from the Legendre line or another line to be related to to Marie Laveau. So you could see that she she was an entrepreneur and it was about people. It was about people and baptizing children. And she and she had slaves. And she knew that she had to baptize a slave because that was the, the law. You had to baptize slaves here in the Louisiana territory, and they had to be baptized in the Roman Catholic faith. So I know that that was probably traumatic for Africans who were Muslims to come here and see all this difference that they have and then they're they're supposed to be Catholic after. Mm. Yeah, so mm. Marie, oh, and Marie also saw that people were being buried. Mm -hmm. She, I mean, she was really, she was an entrepreneur, but it was tagged with, she was very caring about people. And a lot of people did go to her for healing, for sickness with that, for mental problems. I mean, they, for anything, mm -hmm. they might say it was who dude, hmm. you know, and they still went to Marie because they all they needed to say was Madame Laveau, Marie Laveau. I want to see Marie Laveau. Mm. They didn't, they did not necessarily say, do you know anybody who could help me? <laughs> because you had to have a cold. Mm -hmm. Like in, South Carolina and other places, you know, in 
And they said, do you know where I could see a two-headed person? Mm. Which mean a person who see in the spirit world and a person who <laughs> see in the real world. So that's why they call it two heads, because they could do either or, mm -hmm. you know, or to let her, who's like folk medicine with prayers. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Same thing Marie did with medicine, herbs, and prayers, and probably the laying of the hands, which at one time it was considered a mortal sin. If, if you did that, there were a lot of things I didn't realize when I was a little girl because nobody ever talked about it because they did not know. But we practiced the maypole, which was a spring ritual, and we went to Dillard University. <laughs> I have the pictures of it. Mm. I, I forgot to bring it. Yeah. <laughs> I brought the maple. All the girls were dressed in white, and the boys were dressed in white. And we went around the maple first, in and out. Well, I was saying like in and out. That was the wrapping of the streamers because we had the streamers from the top of the maple, which in Fudu is a the center point of heaven and earth. And we, we we walked around the maypole, in and out, and then we braided the maypole. We went in and then under the next person, and then on top, the maypole with the streamers, underneath, on the side of the person, and then up again with the streamers. And that's how we plaited the maypole. So when you look at some of the things, something else, would be red brick. The red brick was used also for cleaning, cleaning your steps, and it would scrub, but it was also to keep evilness out of your home. Just like we keep, or I keep, St. Michael's picture over the entrance to my home so he can protect me because St. Michael is the protector. So when Haitian people came here, which are very high influx of Haitians who settled, well, they were stolen. They were stolen just like the Africans and brought to New Orleans. So those people who were stolen, that is what they did. When they came here, they assimilated with the images of what they thought the images were from their knowledge of what they practiced. So we always say it with the blood of Jesus. But I also put St. Michael over my door. Mm. And everybody in my community when I was little had candles. Mm -hmm. It was when I left out my community and ventured into other communities, I didn't see many candles. So I'm like, ooh, y'all don't have any candles? <laughs> <laughs> because we, we had candles, red candles for storms. We had uh, red candles for storms, and there were white candles, you know, for the angels. So we, we and we had amulets, like the tag that we, we wore for First Communion, and medals. And I think one of the saints was kicked out. He was a traveler, mm. and they didn't want to use him on airplanes anymore. <laughs> they kicked him. They kicked him out of sainthood. <laughs> I forgot his name. <laughs> Let's talk about, you know, I, I I remember the seven sisters and, every, you know, we just had Mardi Gras here and Kalinda Laveau, who is a dear friend of ours. You know, she definitely is trying to bring back the culture of the seven sisters and just really highlight those black women in New Orleans who were healers, were in touch with plants as medicine were also chefs because they were healing people through food. And you could do a lot with food because food has vibration. Food has, you know, you can put spells on people, all kinds of Ooh, stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess now, you know, uh, with gumbo, mm -hmm. you know, when you eat gumbo here in New Orleans, it's a combination of a lot Yes. Of different things. And 
you have ground sassafras leaves. Okay. So when you give a person a bowl of gumbo, they don't really know what they're having, except that it tastes hot. Uh, I just want to clear it up that it's not the hotness from the heat of the food. It's the ground sassafras leaves mm. and maybe a, a little concoction of maybe something else, but it's it's hot. It's, it's hot, and it reminds me of another dish. But before I go into that, you know, with the saints and with the food and the saints and all of that, when women wanted, when women wanted a husband, mm -hmm. they prayed to a saint. As a matter of fact, the saints have different works that they do, okay? And Saint Anne is the mother of Mary, and you were told to go to the St. Anne Shrine and walk the steps. And you say, the women would say, St. Anne, St. Anne, please send me a man. <laughs> and a good man, St. Anne. Now, I saw women and I saw men climbing those stairs saying the rosaries, the decades of the rosary. And I heard them say, Oh, say nay, say nay, please send me a good woman. <laughs> I need somebody to help me clean up and feed me. Send me a good woman, say nay. <laughs> so it all worked, it all worked together. You were featured in an exhibit um, for Rachel's project at was the Ogden Museum. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your contributions and, you know, some of the work that the research that you share with her, because it was really profound. And I mean, she had tons of pictures, archival photos from women, black women in New Orleans who were spiritists. I know what I did. I, I did a, a scene that she did well with, with the, in the WPA, how a voodoo altar was laid with the food on the ground mm -hmm. on top of a cloth. Mm -hmm. And that was really nice. Mm -hmm. Rachel had done that. That was really, really, that was really, really nice. So there was flowers. There were different types of food, beans, not cooked, but, you know, in a, in a pot. And it, that reminded me how I thought about that. They must have called everybody and every female in this city voodoo women hmm. because they would always carry parade because women did not do a lot of driving to each other's homes to pray the decades of the rosary, carrying the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray for people who were sick who needed special help for, for themselves or their children, for their husband or whatever. And it, it went on to different women's houses. They carried the Blessed Virgin Mary. And New Orleans did have public displays of religion. They did have that. In Canada, Louisiana, they parade St. Rosalie in their town because she saved them. I think it was from um, hurricanes, just as the women from the Candomblé, when they have their Bar Morte, the Society of Good Death in August. That's the only reason why I keep my, you know, my passport. <laughs> You're like, I'm going back one day. <laughs> You see, getting off the track of it. You see everybody in your family in Brazil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're all colors, shapes, height, always. You know, so they all, they did that in honor of St. Rosalie. Mm -hmm. I know they were still doing it, and I, I assume that they still do it. And Father Ledoux from St. Augustine Church was the only person I knew that rode a donkey on Good Friday. Hmm. So it was a public display, mm -hmm. you see, mm -hmm. to get the community involved and honor mm -hmm. and to honor the saints, you know, and, and, and the spirit gods. I remember one time and I, I couldn't understand how people didn't understand that when they said the spirit and the body, the human body separate. No, because when you die, your spirits leave you, go somewhere else, take up residency. 
in your body is there. So there is a separation mm -hmm. going to the spirit world and then you have the world. Because how many times have you thought of dead people after they died, when they were here, like somebody cooked something that was really good, you know, or they had a saying that they would say that you're trying to remember their words. Okay. So that's the physical body, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But then you have the DNA. Mm. So you have the connection to all of that because DNA don't die. It never dies. It, DNA never dies. So you have the spiritual mm -hmm. connection to all these dead people mm -hmm. because you still have their DNA. Absolutely. So when you get an illness, disease, or whatever, and they tell you it's hereditary, mm. Say two, it's hereditary. Say. It's from the spirit, from the generation to generation mm -hmm. to generation. Mm -hmm. You see infant smile. Mm -hmm. You see little children playing with their invisible friend. You see, you see all of that. It all comes down with the DNA. Mm. I remember recently I was looking at, I saw a social media post. And it's a Instagram page that talks about Cuba in the 18th and 19th century. And there was this article that was posted from, I think, the early 1900s. And a tourist noticed that everyone walks around with this white talcum powder all over their face or all over their bodies. And I thought to myself, you know, just how cultural memory is. And like you remember, you talked about Cato's wife. And how she put ribbons mm -hmm. on the tomb. And then I thought about Cascadia and, you know, in Nigeria, Efun, where this powder, you know, and subconsciously we might not remember, but, you know, when we would see our grandmothers put baby powder all over them, you know, those were cultural memories from a time when Efun was used as you know, spiritual protection. And then you talked about red bricks and how that was used as a, a form of spiritual protection as well as cleansing. So all of these materials, even plants as medicine, when you look at slate, you know, some of the narratives or WPA narratives, mm -hmm. enslaved people were healing people back then. Oh, we had doctors here from Africa. And the midwives, they were they were from Africa. So they were healing the other people that were captured. They didn't have pre-science. It was pre-science. Mm -hmm. Everything here was pre-science. So the French didn't know anything about healing. And <laughs> <laughs> the French. <laughs> that's why they had to find other people to come here because the Frenchmen were, were you know, laid back. <laughs> my brother, my oldest brother, cannot stand talcum powder mm. because <laughs> he said. Mama put, she would take the bottle and just dump it. <laughs> she would just dump it on him. <laughs> so he could not stand mm. powder on. And she would dress him. There's a picture of him that we have. He looked like he's about five when he was only two. Mm. So <laughs> I laugh. I laugh about that all the time because he he doesn't want any power. He can't. <laughs> he don't want to be protected. <laughs> <laughs> he needed protection. Uh, I said, well, I said, think of the age. There you you was the little baby doll. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're the first born. Uh, <laughs> so you are the baby doll in the family. And that's how they treated you, like you was a little baby doll. <laughs> uh, so, but those kind of things, you could, you can use them. Women can use them in cosmetics. You mm -hmm. could take beads and put on your face and that would be rouge. Mm -hmm. You could take ground coffee, mm -hmm. you know, the liquid, and you could color your gray hair, mm -hmm. charcoal, a little charcoal for the eyebrows. Let's talk about some uh, other women outside of Marie Laveau. Can you mention any other black women during the 18th and 19th century who uh, made an impact on... New Orleans culture and spirituality. Joe, so you would have to know them by going to their home because it wasn't that talked about, except that they were 
going and say the old, I mean, say the, um, the rosary. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know who was doing what. You just saw him carrying the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it went by different people's houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so they were right in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know who was doing what. Mm -hmm. But when I got older, I did participate in it, but they didn't do nothing extraordinary to me. They just, they prayed mm -hmm. and they talked. Mm -hmm. And it was very relaxing. You know, they're talking about healing and how we should pray. I mean, I go to St. Jude's Shrine. I leave my petitions just like you leave petitions for an condom blade. Mm -hmm. You leave, and I, I leave petitions at St. Jude's Shrine because you write your, you know, what you what you need. And they did it at the St. Anne Shrine, but there was no supervisor there. You just you. Oral history. So you just heard it and then you went there and you did the same thing because something drew you, something drew you there. And maybe it was conversations with the elders in your family that you said, well, I'm going to try this because they would tell you, child, you need to go see so and so and so. You better pray to say Nan mm. or you better pray to this one. You say Michael because you got it bad. Or oh, they would say you wear the veil. This person wears the veil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's all there. But it's it's cultural memory, just like with the maypole. They don't know why we was really doing the maypole because none of them would say, "Oh well, that was from Haiti. That was voodoo." No, this is, well, it's the springtime of the year. St. John's Eve. Oh, yeah, the longest day. But they have reasons. They have reasons of all of that. So when the people, were, people were brought here, they had to make the Catholic saints coincide with the, the deities or rishas, whoever they worship, to represent Idembala's God. We call him God. Uh, and he created everything. So the Mbala, everything. Or St. Patrick. He saw the staff. Could have been Moses. It could have been anybody. Because the, the English did not, did not like groups of people, Irish. They didn't, they did not like Irish people. So that's why they sent them to Haiti and places like that and put them underneath the slaves, enslaved people. So it's what you hear was given to you for information and for you to take it away with you. I remember I went to a very, very school, as I said, it was the Lena C. Jones School. And I thought I was the cutest thing. And we all were cute little girls and boys because we had a uniform, a little pleated skirt, which was a nickel of pleat at the dry cleaners, a white blouse and a red ribbon. And we had to walk from Valina C. Jones to Corpus Christi for religious instruction. And the nuns did not like us. And they said we were heathens because we went to public school. Now as cute <laughs> as we as cute as we were, you know, I have to show you the pictures of me. I've I was seen some cute. of them. You were really cute. <laughs> You still well, are. They, they told me if I had if I did something terrible, that was a mortal sin, and my soul was black. Mm. And I was I was trying to figure out what was my soul. <laughs> I never I never knew where my soul was. And then they said, Well, if you did a little thing, well, you just had black spots on you. I mean, I don't have any black spots. I have freckles, but I didn't have black spots. Mm -hmm. And then if you didn't have any sin, if you did not commit any sin, it was white. Hmm. Your soul, your soul was white. What were all these colors? It was, oh, they did. That is what they told us. And they would go to the board. And if, if you had modern sin, they would take the chalk and cover it all up. And then for the dots, it took the chalk and did dots on it like that. Mm. 
Yeah. Mm. Well, we are, you know, so excited to have Madame Trevine on this episode for the second time. And we are we, we will be back after these messages from our advertisers. And we're going to go into her goodie box and find out all of these little trinkets and salves and Florida water that she has. <laughs> and we're going to talk about it. So we'll be back right after a few messages. Whether you're a chef or just love going to restaurants, you know the best ingredients are everything, especially when it comes to beef. In Northern Australia, there's a different approach to raising high-quality beef. West Holm, based in Queensland and Northern Territory, is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. They look after a sweeping stretch of territory, from Brisbane to Darwin, with a climate as varied as the landscape. West Holm raises Wagyu beef, but there's a saying that their real job is to grow grass meaning that if they take care of the land, the rest will take care of itself. West Home stewards 16 million acres of rangeland guided by their natural ecosystems. West Home's team of rangeland experts and nature managers use a variety of tools to monitor and respond to the welfare of the environment, like satellites that assess grass health and on-the-ground research. Cattle are happier when they have the freedom to forage and explore. So West Home ensures that they can roam wild, foraging at will for the first two to three years of their lives. Their cows graze on native grasses like Mitchell grass, which is only found in Australia, along with dozens of other plants, herbs, and seasonal legumes. The result is signature Australian Wagyu, built on a genetic lineage tracing back to Japan and imbued with the terroir of Northern Australia and a flavor suited to complement any cuisine. West Home believes that when nature leads, flavor follows. Learn more at westhome.com. So we're back. Madame Trevine, this box that you have brought to your kitchen table. Tell me what's in there. Oh, I have all kind of goodies. Goody, goody, goody. Yes. Goodies, some items that people use every day. Okay. Yeah, people use this every day. I saw you. You showed me the smelling salt earlier. What was the smelling salt used for? When somebody died. Somebody passed out and you put the smelling salt underneath them. No, you tried to catch them before they passed out. <laughs> When they started getting a little weary, you know, mm. and you put it under their nose. Mm. Do I smell it? You know, it smell. it's exactly the same that I was in Morocco a couple of years ago for Thanksgiving. And they have a smelling salt as well, but it's it's natural. And I remember it just like rushed right in. It, it opened the up the sinus. sinus. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It, it cleaned your sinus. Before somebody pass out, Lord. <laughs> No, they had to have because they got the word that there was a death in the family at yeah. home. Yeah. Because everybody just died at home. And they, no, they brought it with them when they come to see what was yeah. going on. They couldn't leave and then go back and get it. I don't think we talk enough about, you know, just the the history of death, specifically in New Orleans. You know, um, Herman Grima or the Gallia Historic Houses does an excellent tour every um, every Halloween. And they talk about Creole mourning. Oh, and even in the Mardi Gras Museum or as a Cabildo, you know, they used to have lockets. Once your loved one passed, they'd have the lockets and they put a piece of hair in it. Yeah, yeah. I have a locket like that. And I'm saving my ponytail. See how long it is now? I see you growing. I'm like, oh, look at you, Shay. It's, yeah, it's been a couple of years and I'm going to cut it. OK. And give it to my granddaughters. Aww, so they always have a piece of your hair. Yeah, they have a piece of my hair. I got... I have my sister's ponytail. It's yeah. about that long. But, you know, talking about hair, when you think about it, I mean, the old folks, I can remember they would always say, sweep up your hair after you get it cut and buried in the backyard, you know? Yeah, because the birds would make a nest and give you a headache, too. Not just because of that, because I think they were also afraid that somebody would do something on them, you know, with Ooh, their hair. yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Always wrap your hair up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But what else you got in here? Well, this is, it used to be called black sab, black drawing sab. And it was used like if you had a splinter under your skin, you, you could open it up and put it on. And it's not called that anymore. It's called it's my mall. It's my mall. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again just for the, for the audience. <laughs> I, I'll spell it. I-C-H-T-H-A-M-M-A-L-L. 
M O L, and it's an ointment. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to get this little. Let me help. See you. if you can get that off while I look for something else. Okay. Put the, the, the security on here. You have it. Uh-uh, I'm gonna have to probably stick a nail in it. Duck. This is a jar of duck fat that you can you can cook with. Well, when we got sick, they gave us goose grease and oh, it's still black. It's still black. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you all want the name again? It was good. It's still good. Mm. It, I-C-H-T-H-A-M-M-O-L. Ointment. It's not called black sab anymore. Black drawing sab. And this jar I have is duck oil, duck grease. And they used to make goose grease and honey whenever you were sick. And then later on, in my adult years, they had it in a white bottle where you could still buy it. And now they don't have it like that anymore. They have it, they have it labeled as premium cooking oil with no preservatives in it. So I guess people don't catch ducks no more. <laughs> <laughs> for, for that. They tell you you have to cook with it. Uh-huh. But it was right there. It's cage free animals, gluten and milk free, no preservatives. Great for cooking up to 375 degrees. Look, that's a picture of a goose. I see it. I see it. <laughs> so they don't, they just say duck. See, they don't call it goose grease and honey anymore. This is a bottle of the wonderful smelling Florida water. Oh, uh, smell it. Mm-hmm. Love Florida water. Okay. Well, this was used by contemporary, my time, barbers. They would put that on your face. We're not there. They were shaving, but the intentions of Florida water is to have calmness, have your house blessed with that, for goodness, for good, for good things to happen for you. And remember, you have to remember that the barbers were practicing positions mm. because that's why they had the red and white cylinder. Talk about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. outside of their barber shop because they practiced that. They were mm-hmm. and and everything had a number, so nobody else would know mm-hmm. if you were buying a portion of something mm-hmm. or herb of something because it was by numbers. Mm-hmm. And you can find that in New Orleans at the old drugstore at Royal Street, no mm-hmm. Charter Street. Mm-hmm. It's on Charter Street. In the French Quarter, they have the museum mm-hmm. to that. And it's very, very interesting. And lithium, everybody was on lithium back then. Mm-hmm. It took the ouch out the grouch. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> just like, uh, what was that other, that other remedy? Paragoric. Mm-hmm. They was giving people opium. Mm. 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 The doctors in my time gave my mom and, and everybody else's mom opium. Mm. Paragoric with a little sugar on the spoon. Mm. Well, they did. Mm. They did. It still was not, it was still pre scientific, you see? Yeah. Now they're saying, no, you can't give them this medicine. No, you can't give they them didn't that know. medicine. They didn't know. Yeah. They didn't know what they were doing. They it's it's interesting that you mentioned about because I'm I'm putting two and two together, you know, and just how powerful, especially in black communities, the barbershop is. Oh yeah. But when you and you just said something because sometimes you know there's always oh you know, I think that we don't because of what was done, you know, and slavery bondage, purposeful erasure of um, cultural memory as well as, you know, this to the religion as well, Christianity, all of the religions that, you know, pushed us to forget. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. But when you said that, it just like, Whoa, you know, putting Florida water on black men when their haircuts, when Mm -hmm. they get their haircuts, then putting a little bit of powder on the back of their neck. Yeah. That's the same thing. Yeah. That's the same ritual. (laughs) 
<laughs> they put cascadilla yeah. on the back of their necks. <laughs> You're just saying it in a different way. Right, <laughs> You're right. just doing it in a different way, but it's the same. Mm. It's the same ritual. Mm. It is the same ritual. Mm. And you know, when what you do too at the university, you have a lot of men who talk about cooking and how they're the best cook. So they tie with each other. Mm. Who's the who's the best cook? Mm-hmm. So you can get some good recipes from some of these men. I know they can cook too. Now what they what they doing with some of them? They putting spells in that food too, like the women used to. Because <laughs> uh, what, what's that? Sorry, nothing like a Louisiana man. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, good. <laughs> and that's why all the men come here and they stay. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, they took some kind of herb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of herbs too, I had an herb in here, not this. Oh yeah, this is an herb. This is an herb. Oh, this is where it gets X-rated. So make sure your children ain't listening. <laughs> No, this is I'm not gonna do it like that. But <laughs> this is a powder. Let me. Uh, I don't think it's crystals. It's powder. But the women in store reveal, in other places, professions, occupations, when they had a hard night. Well, they had a, a little powder called alum mm-hmm. that they could just put on their body. And make everything, it's like a... Not just on their body, but the the, the right body, the part of the body. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you could be back at work in the morning. <laughs> yeah. That's what it was about. <laughs> Fresh eyed and bushy tail. But you know what's fascinating to me, just linking this back to, you know, Africa and the Caribbean. This alum, you know... There's also so many other medicinal plants that are used. Oh, yeah. Kayamata, you know, is one of them in Africa that's used to, let's just say, it's from the kola nut. Let's just say it's used for women before they get married so their husband will be happy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. All of these are ancient medicines. These are, yeah. The fact that they remember, you know, and and like you said, a whisper, you know, there to yeah. each generation. You can use vanilla extract that you put in cakes as perfume because that's what they have in. It's like a binding because mm. they had to make perfume. They have to have bonding um, agents. So, and, and, and vanilla, you, you buy candles to have vanilla. Mm-hmm. So, and you have uh, the vanilla that go in your pound cake. Mm. You you have these things already. Mercuricum, eucalyptus oil. I use, I still use charcoal. I like the smell in Catholic church when they do rituals. Mm-hmm. I have... Frankincense, yeah, that the one of the frankincense what they use in that was Catholic. brought to Christ, yeah, mm-hmm. frankincense, myrrh, and there was something else, mm-hmm. the three incense that mm-hmm. was brought. And what about this coconut oil right here? Coconut oil is real good for your skin. Mm-hmm. It's this is Butcher Boy, and it's a hundred percent pure refined coconut oil. And what's fascinating to me is if you look, you know, back at some of the ads, advertisements, because there was such an interest and, you know, fetish, you know, how New Orleans was fetishized, you know, and just really marketed as this voodoo culture, et cetera. People made money off of that. They did. Places I found advertisements in Chicago where, you know, some of these pharmacies were selling you know, mojo bags, oh, yeah. bags, yeah. et cetera, or you could get cure. And black folks up north were buying it because, you know, they needed some support, some spiritual protection yeah. up north. They did. They did. Peppermint oil. Peppermint oil is good. Like you get a little blister. Mm-hmm. On my, just take it. It's going to sting, but that, that little pimple is going to go away. Mm. Oh, they used to use... Olive oil on my scalp, on all of our scalps. And if you wash your hair, 
like the next day. I never had a problem with dandruff. Hmm. Still don't because I still put olive oil. Mm -hmm. I still put olive oil on my scalp. Mm -hmm. So all these things that say, you got hoodoo. <laughs> well, <laughs> hoodoo started, the word hoodoo, and that voodoo started when the U.S. military was in Haiti for the war. And the, the, um, the soldiers came back home and said, they got all that hoodoo going on hmm. <laughs> over there. <laughs> so I guess they were seeing some voodoo women. <laughs> Yeah, I got hoodoo. They didn't want to call it voodoo. They say, hoodoo, who do you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it must have been. <laughs> That's what it must have been. It was a maybe it was a catch to it, a secret, you know, who do. Who do you know? Mm -hmm. Do you know a two-headed person or who do you know? Mm -hmm. Tell me who you know. Yeah. There's a resurgence of Haitian culture in New Orleans right now. Recently, there's a, a band called Ram Haiti and they were they lived in New York, and when they came here to perform, I mean that's what someone told me. So you know, I'm hoping I'm correct. But when they came here to perform, they're like they moved the whole band here and just said, "I'm moving here." <laughs> I wonder why. Uh, and we have um, Charlie Pierre at Fritide, New Orleans. It has a Haitian. Remember, we went to go eat there. Oh, that was a good restaurant. They have another um, restaurant on the West Bank that is, you know, you feel like you're in Haiti. Somebody pulls up, I think, on a Saturday, and they they have musicians, live musicians. You get a whole fish, and. You know, there's a Haitian, I think there's a Haitian food festival coming up with sometime in April. Oh, how nice. Yeah. So there's definitely a resurgence of Haitian culture here in New Orleans. But what do you think about when people, you know, demonize African spirituality or Caribbean spirituality, New Orleans spirituality, and, you know, push push it aside or want to not even talk about it or have a lot of fear behind it and negativity towards it. It's unknown to them. It's unknown to them. And the person is not interested in different aspects of life. You know, I was always curious about, well, what is this? And I questioned myself, why do you like all this different kind of food? So then finding all my ancestors, I knew why the DNA never die. That's why you have different tastes, you have different likes, and you have to be aware of all these things that is about you. And if you don't have a passion, I ask people, do you have a passion about anything? You know, I say, well, you just lost out if you don't have a passion about something mm. in your life. I can remember, you know, just remembering my elders talk about dreams a lot, and they would interpret dreams. What were some of your memories of those who... Dreams? Yeah. I saw things. I remember a dream. I, I can go back on a dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could pick up on a dream. Mm -hmm. But when, when I had the surgery on my arm, I don't want a dream. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get all the chains out. <laughs> you don't want that dream. Oh, no. <laughs> I was hallucinating. I'm like, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> that's why you have to have protection around you. Mm. And that's why I know why I like different foods now. Mm -hmm. I like all kind of food mm -hmm. from all, all over mm -hmm. because of my ancestors. That taste is there. The thou clothes you like is there. Everything about you is from your ancestors. Mm -hmm. Oh, and some people don't want to claim their ancestors because they wasn't prominent. Mm -hmm. But you can't get rid of the DNA. So when they tell you you have a, a, a illness that is hereditary, you don't know who to blame. Mm. But if, if they tell you it's hereditary, then you know you got it from somebody. Mm. And it may not be in your immediate family. Mm. It could be seven generations, 12 generations back. Mm. But it is because it don't die. Mm. It, don't, it don't ever die. Mm. So when they tell you it's hereditary, trust me. It's one of your ancestors or two. And some people don't want to acknowledge that because there wasn't somebody important, you know, or they had a um, bad life. Mm. You know, they wasn't prominent. Mm -hmm. So they only want those kinds of ancestors. They don't want the ancestors who really knew what life was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and embraced it. I say give me the ancestors who embraced life. 
Mm-hmm. and loved life and left all these things for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm very grateful that I am who I am because of my ancestors. Ashe. Yeah. Ashe. Oh, the last, you know, before we end this program, and I know we could listen to Madame Trevine all day Well, I can come back. You could always come back. You always welcome on my show. Come on now. <laughs> I want to talk about Rose Nicole. Okay. Yeah. And your love for Kalaz. And oh, I make about, good kalas. You do, you do, you do. <laughs> to show kalas, to, to show all kala. hot kalas. I would love for you to talk about it. I know we talked about it previously a little bit on the episode, but I'm just wondering if you have, you know, it's just your ideas of just black women in the 18th and 19th century who were street food. Oh, they made kalas. And, you know, the Africans ate kalas, the Chinese people ate kalas. I mean, rice. You know, they made rice. But you had the merchant merchants who were cooking on the streets, like in Brazil. They, Marie was probably cooking in the house, you know, and then bringing it, bringing it out to the prison. But it's day old rice, and it has to be cold, but it has to be mushy. And you you have the, the cinnamon, you have all the other ingredients, you have the sugar, you have good hot grease. And you have some other ingredients that go into it. And you fry it till it's brown. You make a little ball. So you need two spoons. And you put it in each spoon to get a nice little ball. And then you drop it into the heat. Not a smoking heat. You don't want that. And when I was little, they used to take a brown paper bag, split it down, and place each kala on that. Then you wait till it cool and sprinkle the powder powdered sugar over it because if you sprinkle that when it's hot, it's going to melt. Mm. So you wait till it cool off a bit and then sprinkle the powdered sugar and you could serve it with milk. You could serve it with champagne. Mm. You could do whatever suits, whatever floats your <laughs> Now, let me just say, Madame Trevine is a redhead, sassy fire woman. That's all. <laughs> Talk, to that fire. Talk to my ancestors. Talk to my ancestors. Yes, somebody was redhead back in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. They told me, I am a mambo. <laughs> I am a mambo. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, y'all, thank you for joining Culture and Flavor. It's been such a pleasure to sit here with the one and only Madame Barbara Trevine, I am so honored to be your friend, and we have been friends for many years. Many years. We, you have literally watched my boys. Grow I up. did. <laughs> I watched them. Those little boys grow. They're young men now. <laughs> and I thank God for you because you also taught. Not only were you teaching me, you taught them as well, and so many in New Orleans. And we just want to honor you and give you your. Oh, I thank you so and much your for that. Water and, and all I, of that. That's right. <laughs> The Mambo Queen here. (laughs) Thank you, Shay. (laughs) Thank you. Culture and Flavor is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org.